Before I start this video, I just want to say in an effort to keep expanding Major Prep, I've made a Major Prep Twitter account so people can let me know what videos they might want to see, plus I'll be posting articles, videos, and more about videos I'm working on such as this one, so you can all stay updated and get more detail. There's also a Facebook page and group if you haven't seen it yet, which are all linked below, but now let's get into the video. The first story today is about a recent drone race in which two drones raced each other, one powered by artificial intelligence, so it flew on its own through the help of cameras and complex algorithms, and one powered by a human who was a world-class drone pilot. Now, artificial intelligence has been used lately to beat humans in a variety of things, but when it comes to the results of this race, the human won. After several laps, the human averaged 11.1 seconds per lap, while the AI-powered drone averaged 13.9 seconds. However, there were some things to take note of between the AI-powered drone and the human-powered one. The AI-powered drone did the obstacle course very smoothly, whereas the human-powered one flew in a slightly more chaotic manner. The drone was more cautious, but more consistent in how it flew. The human-powered drone had more varying lap times. One issue that came up for the AI-powered drone was that it moved fast enough sometimes that its camera became blurred and it lost track of its surroundings. These drones were able to fly 80 miles per hour in a straight line, but due to the turning obstacle course, they got to max speeds of closer to 40 miles per hour before needing to use the brakes. This goes with what I talked about in the last episode, how they want to use drones to automatically navigate warehouses, find products, catalog items, and more. Another use of this is to use drones to navigate disaster sites for rescue operations. This technology is still advancing, but there's a lot that's been done. Artificial intelligence cannot beat humans in everything, but stories keep coming up about AI projects beating the best players in the world in their respective game. Moving on, the next story is about NASA's Psyche mission. Currently, NASA is expected to launch a spacecraft into space in 2022 to investigate and explore an asteroid known as 16 Psyche that is made of metal. It's been estimated that the value of the iron making up this asteroid would be worth around 10,000 quadrillion dollars although they don't plan to bring any back to use in industry, but rather explore this asteroid which they think may be the exposed core of a planet once the size of Mars. The spacecraft is set to arrive at its destination in 2026, but what I really want to talk about is one thing that will be on board the spacecraft, the Deep Space Optical Communications Package. This will utilize photons or light to communicate data back to Earth, and this is expected to be very big in the future, especially for space communication. Now most things you know of or use that communicate wirelessly do not do so using photons or light. Your phone, radio, Wi-Fi, walkie-talkies, satellite TV, various government satellites, and more communicate using RF or radio frequency signals. Radio frequency just refers to signals with frequencies between 20 kHz and 300 GHz. It doesn't just mean radio. For example, FM radio operates at around 100 MHz, and certain satellites can operate at 20 GHz and higher, which is 200 times higher than FM radio. But light operates between 4 and 8 times 10 to the 14th Hz, which is around 4 million times higher than FM radio. Now note that all of these are electromagnetic waves that exist on a spectrum. Just like X-rays and gamma rays, radio waves and visible light we see are all just electromagnetic waves. The difference is that light is at a much higher frequency than RF signals, as you can see by the sinusoidal wave of increasing frequency as you go to the right. They all travel at the speed of light, but their difference in frequencies make for different properties. And the thing about light is we can use it to communicate information much faster than traditional RF equipment. They travel at the same speed, but since high frequency means low wavelength, information can be tightly packed together. So going back, NASA's project is going to need to communicate information like high-resolution images very quickly over a distance of 0.1 to 2.5 astronomical units, where 1 AU is the distance between the Earth and Sun. Using laser communication to do so can improve the speed and efficiency of this communication by a factor of 10 to 100. It will also do this without having to increase mass, volume, or power needed. The system on board has to use a flight laser transmitter, photon counting detector arrays for the ground-based receiver to interpret the information, and they need to make sure that other signals like solar energy, which can be thought of as background noise, aren't going to interfere with the receiver. There's already laser communication technology out there for space communication, and even remote controls use light to communicate with the receiver, so this is not completely new. And by the way, these often use infrared light, which is just out of the frequency range that humans can see, which is why you don't see anything coming out of your remote. But this NASA project will be an important advancement in the deep space communication technology by helping communicate the quickest and clearest information from this type of expedition. Years ago, lasers allowed CDs to become a thing, which made other technology completely obsolete. So who knows what lasers will do to wireless communications in the future? Many say it definitely is the future of space communications, though. This is another optical engineering type project, which would be big for electrical engineers and also physicists to get into. 
The next story includes a research team that has created a near-perfect streaming algorithm, which I will explain. There's an article from Quanta Magazine I'll link below that goes into detail, but I will give a summary. Streaming algorithms are used to analyze and process streams of data that are continuously coming in and can often only be analyzed once. Like if Twitter needs to determine what hashtags are trending. You can't just stop time and look at all the hashtags, count them, and see what's coming in the most. You have to figure out how to tally everything as it happens without going back because there's always new info coming in. But this is not easy to do, and the article gives this great example. What if I gave you a list of numbers and you had to determine the sum of all of them? But I will give the numbers one at a time, then erase them as I go. So like 5, then 6, then 1. That sum is 12. Fairly simple, but now let's do it with a few more numbers, and all you have to do again is figure out the sum. So the first number is 3, the next is 4, then 2, then 6, 5, 1, 2, and last 9. So what's the sum? I bet most people could get that it's 32. And how did you do that? Well, probably when you were given 3, which came first, you stored that in your memory. Because you need to remember that even after it went away. Then when the 4 came up, which was next, you added that to 3 and got 7. Then you erased the 3 that was in your memory and put 7 in there instead. Okay, you didn't actually erase it, but you no longer cared about any previous data. Just this one sum that you have now. You kept this going with each one and just remembered the new sum after each number. This is a running sum. How come you didn't try just to memorize all the numbers and add them up at the end? Because you did not want to put every number into your memory. It takes up a lot of space and all you really had to do was just put one into memory at a time. Well, we don't want computers to have to use up all of their memory as well. So this is an efficient way to do that. But what if we did the same thing where I give you numbers one at a time, but instead you had to answer at the end which numbers showed up the most. And imagine I gave you like a hundred numbers. We won't do this, but what would you do? This is the bigger challenge and is one thing streaming algorithms need to be optimized to do. Well, this new almost perfect algorithm that was recently created basically remembers just as much as it needs to know what it's seen the most frequently. So you don't need to remember everything, but you need to remember just some, and this algorithm optimizes that. And this is what it's like for companies like Google that want to analyze searches to see what are the most viewed sites, but they're constantly getting bombarded with data and can't always go back to check old data. In the 80s, two people came up with a solution to this problem, but it was not perfect. The issue was they could tell what was frequently looked up, like it could see, hey, Forbes is getting a lot of traffic all the time. But it could not tell what was trending. Like it would have had trouble knowing that the search term iPhone is getting a spike in searches all of a sudden because of its release on a given day. Streaming algorithms try to forget as much as possible without losing their ability to do their task, and this advances the concept of strategic forgetting. There is so much data coming in around the world at all times, and companies are always trying to analyze and organize it in the easiest way possible. For those who find this interesting, this is something big for computer scientists, making better algorithms to do tasks as quickly and efficiently as possible. But note that most people graduating in computer science are not getting jobs where they're creating new algorithms, especially those with just a bachelor's. If anything, they're using already known algorithms to help solve whatever problems they need to. This would be more of a research-based assignment for those who have further education or at least experience. And I've talked about before how computer scientists care about discrete math and not so much the math we're used to from high school, and I thought this kind of made sense here. Notice how for optimizing this algorithm, it would not involve using the quadratic formula, finding a velocity vector based on position, or dividing polynomials. Computer scientists do a lot of math, but it's a different kind of math known as discrete math. In the computer science video on this channel, I discuss a little about what discrete math is, which I'll link below, and I'll end that story here. And this last story is another Elon Musk project, which is pretty famous, but I had to talk about it anyway, and that is The Boring Company. This is a project in which Elon Musk wants to create a network of underground tunnels that can transport vehicles to their destination in an effort to avoid traffic and also reduce traffic congestion, especially in big cities. In Los Angeles, he says this will reduce a typical 45-minute drive to 5 minutes. He says that we have a two-dimensional transportation network in which we have lanes side by side, but nothing really up or down besides things like airplanes or subways. Now, many people have talked about flying cars, but Elon Musk thinks we need to go down instead of up. Some of the pros of this listed on their website include there's no practical limit to how many layers of tunnels can be built, so any level of traffic can be addressed. Tunnels are weatherproof. Tunnel construction and operation are silent and invisible to anyone on the surface. 
and tunnels don't divide communities with lanes and barriers. Now, of course, this sounds awesome in theory, but there are a lot of concerns and issues to work out. One being the cost, because it does cost a lot to drill underground. Some projects cost over a billion dollars per mile. Plus, there are, of course, safety concerns. One you may think of is, what about earthquakes? But on the Boring Company FAQ page, they acknowledge this and say tunnels, when designed properly, are known to be one of the safest places to be during an earthquake. From a structural safety standpoint, the tunnel moves uniformly with the ground in contrast to surface structures. Building structures that can stand up against earthquakes is a big thing for civil engineers and is something to look into if that interests you. They started digging months ago on SpaceX property in Los Angeles, but in August he got permission to dig past property lines. He also got permission to start digging in Maryland and wants to connect New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. It may be a while before we see this, but this is in the works. And I'm actually going to end that video there as these stories were a little longer. I hope you enjoyed this video and there will be plenty more to come. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.